As a pacifist, I don't believe in violence. But it was then I knew, I was going to punish them and destroy their lives. If you like true revenge stories of epic proportions, you found the best channel. In this episode, we start off with a truly dark act of revenge, an old lady who has been put up with years of abuse, has zero mercy for her dying husband and his last wish. Secondly, a doctor cheats and feels the vengeance of his wife's sister. Followed by an abusive frick boy who gets hacked and loses heart. Lastly, a heartbreaking story about a man taking revenge on his wife, who cheats on him with his close friend. Before we start, give your homeboy Royal AI some sugar by liking this exceptionally thrilling episode. The last one is for the loyal viewers, best for last. Now, let's dive in. Naturally, viewer discretion is advised. These revenge acts might be disturbing to snowflakes. My grandmother-in-law shared this story with me and my wife last night. This story involves quite some disturbing thought. My grandmother is fairly wealthy. Thanks to family money and a few good investments, she built up her inheritance to what it is now. Due to never having to work and enjoying the finer things in life, like a bottle of white wine a day keeps the doctor away. She had the circle of friends that were quite wealthy or successful themselves. It's like a cliche from a movie. This story involves one of those friends she had. I will call her friend Maria and her husband will be named Joseph. Maria and Joseph were long time married. They started with a small furniture business. Maria was the salesperson and Joseph was responsible for buying the new collections. While Maria had to stay in the country and keep an eye on the shop and the kids, Joseph could venture trough Europe in the search of new, cheap but nice furniture to flip with a good profit. It all started fine. Kids were growing up and the shop got quite successful. Eventually becoming one of the biggest ones in the country. This thanks to mutual effort of Maria and Joseph. However, dark clouds started to form in their marriage. Joseph wasn't only looking to score furniture, he also scored loads of women in other countries. Leaving Maria alone for weeks while he scored a few couches and sexy timed on some as well. This is the pre-digital area so there were no mobile phones yet. Only the promise to send a letter once in a while. During their life together, Joseph would cheat on Maria every time he saw the chance. After a while, he didn't seem to care anymore if Maria knew. Would even bring his mistresses to the home city, to spoil them in fancy restaurants. Note, this was a different time, women rights are established now but this wasn't so back then. When Maria decided that it was enough, the abuse began. Mentally as physically he started to abuse her for a long period in their marriage, she couldn't leave him because of the kids, her lifestyle, the business, and he knew this. So she endured and every time she decided to fight back, there were painful consequences. He was the man, even having sexy time with her without her permission, just to establish his rights as the man. Later in their life, they are becoming elders, gave the shop to their kids and retired. Decided to take it easy. Maria long lost her interest already in Joseph but still couldn't leave him. When money is involved, people tend to endure a lot. And, Joseph got sick, really sick. A combination of Parkinson and cancer. Eventually ending up in a wheelchair. Maria, like every good old wife, decided to nurse him till she couldn't do that anymore. In my country you have something like euthanasia. If you still have a good mind and you have a lot of pain, you can go to the doctors and the notary. They'll draft a paper for whenever you cannot care for yourself anymore, this way you could commit legal suicide, simplifying terms. Crucial side note, it's important to add that the spouse has to keep the official letters and make the final say, because the person involving this, often doesn't have the correct mindset anymore. And thus, her revenge began. Joseph got worse, Joseph had to go to the hospital and his cancer started to infest his body. He was a shade of his former self. Having pain all day and morphine could only help so much. Even though he was in the hospital for weeks and weeks, enduring the pain, he started asking for the euthanasia papers. He began to beg to Maria to hand these over and make the pain go away, to finally make it all stop and rest. She would simply smile and said no, which papers? 
The first week he got in the hospital, she already burned the papers. For weeks to come, he begged to die. For weeks Maria was at his side and simply said no, maybe tomorrow. Slowly watching her husband fade away. Hearing his pain, his begging. She would always answer that this is what he deserved. For the outside world, Maria was a caring wife and Joseph was simply too far gone to make sense, so if he rattled about the papers to someone else, she would wave him off. Five weeks in the hospital and Joseph died. It was certainly not a nice death, it was exactly on the terms that Maria decided how he should die, painful and gruesome. Maria got her revenge on her husband. Giving him hope that it could be his last day and the pain will end, but crushing it every day again as well, to let him suffer in a cancer-infested body and to die on her terms, slowly. This revenge took place in the Philippines. Laws are different here from other First World and Western countries. It's a conservative and Catholic country, so marriage and married life is held sacred. Any idea of divorce or separation of spouses is frowned upon by most traditionalists. We are basically the island version of Texas and Alabama, where there's lots of hardcore Bible thumpers. This story is about my sister. I am an only child but grew alongside plenty of cousins, whom I consider my siblings. It happened a few years ago, when I was about to go to college. My sister and her husband have been married for a year or so by then, but haven't had much success in conceiving a child. We live in a Southeast Asian country and surrogacy isn't legal for some reason, so that option was not in the cards for them. They talked about adopting, but both of them really wanted a child of their own. Anyway, after a few months more of trying they decided to just postpone it for a while, considering they're still young as both are in their early 30s. They instead decided to focus on their respective careers and travel whenever possible. All in all, they were having a great life. On the outside that is. About a few months later, my sister noticed a few things, nothing too drastic. Like her husband would receive these late night calls. Her husband is a doctor and he would go to the other room to take it, he was always clearing the history in their shared computer at home, him having to work overtime way too often. She asked me and some of our cousins on what to do. At the time I was dating a guy pretty tech savvy, so I asked him for help. Within two days we had his Facebook, Gmail and Instagram account. We found nothing. I thought okay weird, maybe my sister was being paranoid. Then I had a thought, what about his Viber messenger? After a bit more digging, we were able to get hold of his Viber account and boy did we find things. This poop hole has been cheating on her for almost half a year. We found dozens and dozens of messages between him and some girl. In one of the messages the girl even admits that even though he is married, she loves him and likes the thrill of being with a married man. Revealing this information and being confronted by it, made me feel sick. The girl was just a few years older than me, in her early 20s. They're even exchanging nudes with each other and talking about their little sexual rendezvous. I was absolutely heartbroken. My older sister always wanted a family of her own, and this booty hole whom she thought was the love of her life, had just did this to her. I told my boyfriend to save all of it in a hard drive and log out the accounts. I was hesitant at first to tell her, but I knew she deserved the truth. A few days after debating it with myself, I finally showed her everything. As expected, this broke her. She cried and cried. I was crying along with her as I didn't really like seeing her like this. After hours of both of us sobbing, I decided to try and convince her to take revenge. My sister was never the vindictive type. She was often the timid girl who let people get away with everything, because she didn't like confrontation. She was heavily bullied for this during her school years according to our other cousins that were her age. I told her of my plan. She wasn't really planning on revenge, she just wanted to file for an annulment, divorce isn't legal here, but I knew someone had to teach that jerk not to mess with our family. I told her to pretend everything was okay and that she was oblivious to his cheating. It took a good amount of coaxing but she finally agreed. I decided we needed to catch them in the act, because despite the overwhelming evidence, I had a hunch they would deny it. A week later my sister called me and told me that her husband messaged her from his work. He told her that he might work overtime again at the hospital, 
and would just be sleeping at their condo that was about 10 minutes away. She said sure and called me almost immediately. I smiled and told my sister to meet me at the restaurant across the condominium where her husband would be. I arrived there alone and a few minutes later she arrived. Lucky for us, their condo unit was outfitted with CCTV cameras, we were able to watch a live feed on our phones and computers. Her husband was not fully aware of this, since when they got the condo, it was my sister who took care of outfitting the unit with furniture and stuff. He only signed the paperwork with her at the beginning and rarely had a hand in it. It was supposed to be a rental unit, the husband convinced my sister to let him use it when he would need overtime at work, so he can just sleep there and not have to drive the one hour journey he had to take to get to their house. We viewed the footage as we were sitting down having some drinks. Nothing yet. Husband wasn't there. An hour passed and we see the front door open and in walks husband with his mistress. What is good about the CCTV though, was that it had an audio function, so we can hear their full blown noises while they were sexy timing. At that moment my sister was about to cry, but I told her that he wasn't worth doo doo and it's time to confront them. We went to the unit and sneaked inside using my sister's key. They were in the bedroom still getting it on and I slammed the door open to see them doing it. I can still see the image burned in my mind. To say that these bastards were shocked would be an understatement. Their jaws were literally on the floor when they saw us. He tried explaining and rationalizing the situation but I cut him off. I told him to shut up and prepare for a lawsuit. My sister was in tears at this point and I had to drag her away as her douchebag of a husband was pleading. We drove to her home and packed all his crap up in boxes. The drive home was not pleasant as my sister was still bawling. I comforted her as best I can and told her she would be okay. He got home just a few minutes after we were done packing. She told him that he can't live in the house anymore and that she was leaving him. He said nothing knowing my temper and the fact that if he tried lying, I would have his head then and there he proceeded loading his things in his car. This is not the actual revenge, we're just getting started. The next day, I got the evidence from the hard drive and sent it to the board of directors of the hospital he worked in, the medical board, all his colleagues, friends and family. I also sent out the evidence to the woman's family, friends and to her boss and colleagues. The fallout was glorious. They both lost their jobs, husband even had his license revoked and his parents disowned him. One of our cousins was a lawyer and helped our sister sue him and the woman for concubinage, this is a legal term for adultery. She won the case, was granted an annulment and she got most of their assets in the separation, the house, the condo, cars and money. Her husband got a bit of money, but he had to pay a hefty price for the lawyer since his parents refused to help him. I don't recall how many years they had to serve in jail, but since neither can afford bail, they would be spending a lot of time in a facility and have a permanent criminal record when they get out of jail. My sister is fine now. She's still healing from all that crap and is in a better headspace now. This story starts with Christy, my best friend since junior high. She's like a sister to me, sweet loving soul but has a tendency to be taken advantage of. The opposite of me, I'm a sick vindictive person some might say. Make your mind up after I told you about these following events. She started dating this guy Bruce a while back, maybe a year ago. I don't really know him, but I remember an encounter with him a few years back. First time I saw him, he sat next to me in the bus, saying what a skank Christy is, saying he knows her since elementary school but that she went off to another middle school afterwards, the same one I went to. I barely knew the guy and told him to lay off, telling him she's my best friend and I'm not gonna stand for it. Later I got off at my stop and thought that would be the end of that, just some random jerk. Nope. Big nope. Couple years later, Christy starts hanging out with this friend, being very vague, saying I don't even know him and such. Finally she gives in and tells me that she's been seeing this guy called Bruce Jerky. So I find him on Facebook, do a bit of detective work. He's a cook in a local restaurant, likes comics and airsoft, typical kid, nothing too sketchy about him. The first few weeks of Christie's relationship go fine, all lovey-dovey, nothing out of the ordinary. But then the complaints come rolling in. He's short-tempered, super jealous, 
he said if you try anything stupid with me, he'll kill you. All those were huge red flags, but I guess both of us ignored it all first. It being her first boyfriend, I didn't want to ruin it for her, but I was cautious. I started with a bit of a background check, talking to his friends and trying to get a non-biased opinion on him. Later at a party I met this guy John, I asked him where he knows Bruce from, since he lives quite far away. Turns out Bruce was John's brother's neighbor and that he spends his summers there. While we were talking, Bruce comes up and John told him, that he's going to party with me. Bruce retorts, that he hates me, he'll kill me and that I want to steal his girl. Quick strange escalation but okay mate, I got better things to do than steal your girl. John also tells me some vital info. He told me that Bruce is probably the dumbest person alive and he's thinking about moving to Quebec, but that he can't speak a word in French. He's in luck, because I study French philology at university. I'm starting to get fed up with Bruce's BS, not only what I heard from John, but mostly the way he treats Christy. She deserves a proper boyfriend and should dump him. I call up Christy to go grab a beer and just chat. I use this time to try to talk some sense into her and tell her that if they are serious about moving to Quebec. I added that I could offer Bruce some French lessons so he at least knows the basics and offer him a truce, that I have no intentions of stealing his girl and so on. He accepts and so begins my revenge plan. We meet up the next day in the cafe and I try to teach this, I cannot stress this enough, idiot some basic French. Now all of this is just a cover for me to gain his trust. This goes on for a few weeks and then comes a lesson like any other, except I arrive a bit early and I'm messing around on my computer. Bruce comes and asks me what I'm doing. I'm working on a bootleg Instagram app that lets you download pictures. I show it to him on my phone and he loves it and asks me for a copy. I tell him that I have a better, more stable version on my laptop but that I have to compile it. Wink wink, what I'm actually doing is adding a RAT, remote access tool, with a keylogger and stuff to the app. He, none the wiser, installs the app and we have our lesson. He thanks me for the lesson and introducing him to the app and leaves. When I get home I check my computer and I have everything eye on him, call logs, passwords, location and the list goes on. I snoop around for a while, check his social media and messages for dirt. I found the holy grail that would be the end of his toxic relationship with Christy. I turns out he was cheating on her, which explains his jealousy. I felt so sorry for Christy and so pissed at Bruce for doing this to her. I called up Christy and told her to come to the cafe, alone. I tell her the truth and she is totally devastated, right there and then she breaks up with Bruce. But that's not all, of course, so after Christy leaves, I decide to search his messages, including his messages with Christy. Makes me feel a bit conflicted, so sorry Christy, but this way I find a few pecker picks and decide to have some fun. I send one to his boss, one to his mom and one to one of his airsoft groups just for good measure. I haven't seen him since he cancelled the French lessons after the whole doo-doo storm. Good luck in life buddy. Yours truly. This story took a long time to unfold and come to its final conclusion, so now I can finally tell it. It's a longer one, but it's worth it. My wife Rachel and I grew up in a largish town of close to 30,000 people. We knew each other at an early age, roughly 6 or 7, can't specifically remember. We were practically inseparable. At 16, we started dating each other. When we turned 18, we moved away for work in a city just a few hours drive away. By 20, we were married and had bought our first house. At 22, we discovered that she was pregnant with a boy. It was then disaster struck. About five weeks before she was due to go on maternity leave, a large shelving unit collapsed and crushed her. I was told that both her and our child were killed instantly. Two of her colleagues had also been injured in the accident, one left paralyzed, the other losing his leg after it had to be amputated. The company she was working for, had in a cost-cutting measure, decided to continue using old shelving that had been written off as unsafe instead of replacing it. I still haven't forgiven those executives and management personnel that made that decision, because they cut short the love of my life as well as killing our unborn child. 
It wasn't long after I was told I had a choice on how to proceed with what her company called compensation, but I called it blood money. They wanted to settle out of court to avoid a lawsuit. I, on the other hand, was out for their blood. Just to clarify here, this is not the revenge, this is the backstory. Fortunately, due to the coverage that it got, and involving several politicians, the case was settled quickly in court, roughly three years, in which the payout for all parties was close to 10 times the amount that they had initially offered. A lot of fines were given to them for breaches on work, health and safety, executives were sacked, others were jailed, etc. A story for another time maybe, when I feel comfortable sharing. At this time, I was still working my job in telecommunications. My mother, bless her soul, had moved in while all this was happening to help me. I think I would have fallen apart if she hadn't been as involved as she was. It was around this time, I was offered a promotion, but it involved a lot of travel around the state. I made a request to have an office in my hometown's branch, as I wanted to not only take care of businesses in the state, but in my hometown also as there was no business representative located there to which they agreed. After a few months, we settled into a routine of one to two weeks in the city office, one week in my hometown and one to two weeks visiting the rest of the state. After a year, I decided to buy a house in my hometown, so I wasn't having to stay at my parents' place every week or so that I was home and that I could come and go as I pleased. This is important for later in the story. My apologies for the longer backstory, but it builds up. It is about four years later that our story begins. So I had just returned from one of my trips on Friday, and was checking in some stuff at my office when Harry, the branch's managing director, walked in. We had grown up together also, but had gone to different schools but since coming back had developed a very close friendship. He asked how things were, and then asked me if I wanted to come to a house party that he was having that evening. Short notice and all, but I said yes. I felt like a few drinks with friends were in order. It was there that Harry introduced me to Catherine. She was a new hire at the branch where my hometown's office was located and was getting to know everyone being new in town. We hit it off immediately. As much of a cliché as it sounds, it was almost as if Rachel was in front of me, instead of Catherine. I won't bore you too much with the details, but after two years of dating, we decided to take the next step and she moved into my hometown's house. Everything up to this point had been going really well. Catherine and my parents got along, and Rachel's parents also approved and were happy that someone could make me happy as Rachel had done. All was going well for close to a year when things began to change. Skype sessions were cut short suddenly. Neighbors would tell me about how a car, described to me like it was Harry's, was always seen parked in the back alley near my house whenever I was away. Some clothes that weren't mine were in my wardrobe. All signs pointed to her cheating, but she said that nothing was happening. She said that Harry would come over occasionally to discuss business, but never stayed the night. I chalked it up to me being paranoid and continued on as if nothing was wrong, but there was always this feeling that something wasn't right. It was close to six months after that I discovered that she had been lying to me. I had just finished closing a rather large contract with a new company, and negotiations had wrapped up earlier than I had anticipated. So instead of sticking around for the next few days, I decided to pay for an early flight home and surprise everyone. Fast forward a few hours. I drive into my hometown and down the alley behind my house, so that I could get into the house without being seen and surprise Catherine. Some part of me was curious however as to whether this mystery car was there. Sure enough, there was a car that was blocking the back entrance gate. I was confused for a moment wondering if it had just been a neglectful neighbor parking only to realize that it was indeed Harry's car. If it hadn't been for the high hedge line that I had put in a few years back for privacy, I may have well driven past my own place. Pulling up behind his car, I got out and thought it was strange that he was there so late. As she claimed that he always had left by now. As I approached the back of the house, I saw something that made my stomach drop. In my kitchen, Catherine and Harry were going at it hammer and tong. I froze. Time stopped. There was my close friend, having sex on my kitchen bench with my girlfriend. I didn't know what to do. So many questions were running through my head. Was this real or was I dreaming? 
Why were they having sex in my house? Feeling defeated, I turned and left without them seeing me. I sat in my car for what felt like an eternity. I was crying. Hard. But the sadness quickly turned into anger. The same kind of anger I felt towards those that were responsible for Rachel's death. I wanted to hurt them. Badly. As a pacifist, I don't believe in violence. It was then I knew I was going to punish them and destroy their lives. And what better time to start than now? I moved my car back up the alley, far enough away from my driveway that I could still see Harry's car, and then walked back to the gate where I could see into the house, and called her phone. They were still going for it when it rang. They both looked at the caller ID and did a double take when my name came up. I could see that she was considering answering it and they let it ring out. After a few moments they were back into it again and I dialed once again. This time she did answer. As she was answering I hung up and made my way back to my car. As soon as I did, she called me back. She asked why I was calling as late as I was, and I told her that I was about 10 minutes from home and didn't want to scare her coming in. She, obviously, was shocked and acted happy that I was coming and the call ended very quickly after she said she was going to get up and get changed into something. I said bye and hung up. A few moments later, Harry came peeling through the gate and still half naked, jumped into his car took off like a bat out of hell. I smiled a little, knowing the fear that both of them would be feeling from being so close to being caught. I waited a few moments before turning my car into the same place Harry had been moments earlier. The night was fairly uneventful afterwards and it wasn't until after she was asleep, that I got up and went to my office down the hall. I couldn't sleep. I needed to plan. And plan I did. My mother always taught me to be a pacifist and to allow cosmic karma to take its course. But on this occasion, I decided that karma could use a helping hand. I decided to punish them separately but destroy both of them. I knew that Harry had a drug habit. Nothing major, but he kept it very private. I only knew about it accidentally after seeing some cocaine and we'd left out in his place, but to be respectful of his privacy, pretended I hadn't seen it when he had made attempts to cover it up. I began calling some of my more unsavory clientele and made a few discreet inquiries into obtaining some samples that they were willing to part with. A few days later, I had a decent enough stash for my plan to work. About a month later, I had friends, including Harry, around for a barbecue night. After making sure that I sufficiently liquored up Harry, I told him to stay the night and sleep it off. In the early hours of that morning, I took the drugs, and an assortment of my personal belongings, and placed them at various places around his car, with the biggest stash in his tire well. Confident that he wouldn't find them over the few months as the rest of my plan evolved, I locked the car up and went inside to sleep. I also placed some more drugs and some of my own personal items in his house after driving him home, because he was still too drunk to drive. A few days later, I staged a break-in, by smashing the window of my back door into my kitchen and leaving it open before heading back to the city for a flight. I had several messages the moment I landed. One from my clearly panicked mom, who had found the back door smashed open and had called the police, one from Catherine in tears, and one from the local police asking me to call. After returning all the calls, I informed the police I was away on business, and that I would be back the following week to talk with them. While away, I got Catherine to stay with my parents until after I got back, and asked my dad to organize one of the local security companies to install cameras and an alarm system, after getting the go-ahead from the police as to not ruin the scene of the crime. After getting home, I did the usual my god I can't believe this has happened and why would anyone do this, routine. After doing a thorough check everywhere, finding that the items I had taken were missing and filing a police report, I had the security company's rep talk Catherine and I through how the cameras and alarm system worked. Then came the question I had been waiting for. The question of what happens if we are doing some business and don't want it recorded. She acted a bit shy asking this question. But I knew exactly the reason she was asking. He assured us that this was a question he got asked a lot, and we were shown on the home computer, if we wanted to be doing things without it being recorded, how to stop the recording for certain cameras, so that we could protect her modesty. As I was walking him out, I asked him if cameras were turned off, could a notification be sent out, 
just as a security precaution. He came back in and helped me through how to set up email notifications and left shortly after. Fantastic. All I had to do was wait. At this stage, I approached legal advice for some help in relation to couples law in my country. I needed to make sure that my upcoming plan could legally be done, and that I would not be forced to pay out any money or equity to Catherine. Being the sole benefactor of Rachel's estate, I didn't want to be left with any nasty surprises where Catherine could take any of the estate away from me. I got in contact with a great lawyer who assured me, due to the fact that although we had been dating for close to four years, we had not been living together long enough to be classified as de facto. Mostly because I was paying all the utilities on the property that she was living in and didn't pay rent, showed that she had no legal standing to make a financial claim against me. Just to be sure though, he drew up what I felt was a pretty ironclad document just in case there was any legal trouble. The following week, my work had approached me, and offered me a promotion to move back to the city and run the team that I was a part of. Meaning I wouldn't need to travel as often and be in the one location. I said yes, and began the process of beginning my transfer, which would take about six weeks. Perfect. More than enough time to gather all my evidence. Upon getting back to my hometown the following week, I began to start in motion the rest of my plan. Beautifully ironic, I asked Harry to approve one week's worth of vacation for Catherine for two weeks' time. I wanted to send her and a friend or two away on a retreat before I made the biggest decision of my life for a second time. He jumped up and gave me a huge hug, congratulating me on being prepared to take the leap again. I hugged him back tight, but not the way I think he imagined it at the time. He agreed and blocked out the week for me. I asked him not to say anything to anyone, as I wanted to make it as big a surprise as I could. I knew, that it would spread like wildfire around the office regardless, but that was my plan. That night, I told Catherine that I had booked her and two friends to go to a tropical spa resort, all expenses paid for a week. No questions asked, pick two friends, and come back to the biggest surprise of her life. She screamed like a kid who had just been told that all the candy in the shop was hers to have. I then told her that the following week, I was going to spend it in the city, preparing for a large client who was one of my biggest accounts. Therefore I needed some people in my team to help before flying out the following week and I wouldn't be home until the Monday that she was leaving. So I wouldn't be able to see her, which seemed to disappoint her, but I told her it would be worth it when she returned. What I failed to tell her, was that I had decided to take two weeks vacation on the other side of the country, mentally preparing myself for the shit storm that was about to erupt the moment she stepped foot on the plane, as well as enjoying my first stage of freedom. On Sunday two weeks later, I flew back and began driving home. Once getting there I'd done a quick pass by my house and sure enough, Harry's car was there. Like the first night I had caught them, I parked a little ways back, and checked the cameras. Asleep, in my bed. No surprise honestly, as I had recorded them constantly do this over the two weeks I had been away. I then made my first call to the police blocking my caller ID. I told them that I was one of my neighbors and saw someone hanging around in their car in the alley behind my house, and occasionally passing something through windows to passing cars, while also looking into my yard and I was concerned that they were dealing drugs and or going to break into someone's property. I gave them his license plate and description. They said they would have someone there in a few minutes so I thanked them and hung up. I then called Catherine and told her I was about 10 minutes from home, and that I knew she was flying out tomorrow, but desperately wanted to surprise her. Looking back at the footage now, I laugh at the commotion that I am surprised I didn't hear. In a few short seconds, Harry was half-dressed and flying out the back door to his car. At that point, I couldn't have asked for a more perfect scene. As Harry was peeling away, one of the police cars rounded the corner behind me, saw Harry driving away fast, and gave chase. After pulling in, greeting an excited Catherine, and doing all the couple things, she fell asleep again. I, on the other hand, couldn't sleep a wink. The next day, her and her friends were bundled into a car. After they drove away, I had to wait a few hours, but I began to execute my plan. I called a friend who was a removalist and apologized for the late notice but needed my place packed and moved on Friday. After agreeing on a time, 
I told him that he would need to take certain boxes to a storage facility, which he said wasn't an issue. Then I began packing Catherine's belongings. Later that day, I got a call from the police for me to come and identify some property that they had apprehended from a suspect the previous night, that fit the description of property I had reported stolen. I grinned to myself, happy that my plan for Harry had grown to fruition and replied that I would be there shortly to collect it. Of course, when I got there, some of the items were still unaccounted for, due to the fact that they must have still been in his house and they hadn't searched there yet. By this stage, the town was buzzing with news. Events in my hometown don't stay secret for long. Harry was disgraced and promptly fired for his possession of drugs and stolen property, and our respective bosses on behalf of the company had extended a formal apology towards me during the week. That night I went to my parents' house and told both mine and Rachel's parents what had happened, omitting certain details. And that I was moving back to the city after being promoted, but Catherine wouldn't be a part of it. They were pretty upset initially, that I hadn't let them know what was going on, but were happy that I was handling everything maturely and hadn't sunk to their level. Though they didn't agree with ghosting Catherine, but after some drinks, laughs and tears, I went home. On Friday afternoon, after a busy week of organizing cleaners for the following week, the real estate to put my house on the rental market, and various other tasks at my hometown's office. I packed some things into my car, and drove to my parents' place and said goodbye before the drive. Before leaving, I went to Becky's house. Becky had been one of Rachel's closest friends growing up. She was the only other person who knew what was happening, minus the details about Harry. Without her help, I wouldn't have been able to organize everything as quickly as I had. I gave Becky a large manila folder with my gathered evidence of her cheating, as well as the letter and a few other legal documents from my attorney stating that she was ordered not to contact me, and the details of how to access her belongings located at the storage unit I had rented out. After a quick goodbye, I left and drove back to the city. On Sunday, I woke up to several missed calls, voice messages and text messages. Turns out, Catherine had come home early after being alerted to something being afoot in town, only to find an empty house and a for rent sign out the front. Freaking out, she had gone to my parents, who closed the door on her the moment that they answered, forcing her to call everyone until she managed to somehow be contacted by Becky and told that she had a package for her. I was told that she didn't take too well to that, as I fully well knew at that point from the numerous angry texts and voice messages from her accusing me of setting up Harry, of being deceitful, etc. I was worried that she might show up at my front door, but nothing ever happened. Five weeks later after leaving and been promoted, I'm sharing this with you dear listener. I don't regret doing what I did to him, as he knew both Rachel and I growing up, and knew how hard it was for me to pick up my life after she died. For those also asking if I am worried about Harry finding out and pointing the authorities in my direction, I know that he doesn't watch Royal AI, because he's a snowflake for sure. As for Catherine, people have questioned why I didn't do more to her, or why I stuck around for as long as I did. Honestly, I almost did kick her out after a few days, but I wanted to gather evidence and show proof of her cheating so that everyone she knew would know what she had done. She is a major socialite, her words, and I knew by exposing her it would kill her reputation. As for what happened to her, I have been told that she moved to another state just recently after being transferred. From the people I have spoken to today, she was put mainly on administrative duties before her transfer, as there was quite a bit of backlash after the rumor mill made its way around town. Thank you for enjoying this episode, which was made with artificial love. Subscribe or give Royal AI some sugar by avenging the like button. Could you imagine doing one of these acts yourself? Share your experience below. I'll join the conversation.